turn the floor over to Norb for the con side of it. Okay, I will be arguing the con. So, uh, Reza, I, I didn't know you were going to use uh, some of my publications against me. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I obviously will be uh, arguing the con, and, and really the big question is, uh, do animals provide a sufficient basis for presumption of toxicity and safety test testing? And um, obviously I'm going to be arguing for the application of human uh, cell-based assays and, and toxicity testing. And so some of the examples I'm going to be using are based on the immune system, but I think the comments I'm going to make I think are, are, bro are more broadly applicable. And so, um, to first begin, you know, we've, we, we've, we've talked a lot about um, the fact that the, the, target or the target species that we're trying to um, do regulatory assessments for really is the human, and yet the fact is that we have very little human data and often have no human data at all. Uh, even in the case where we have epi epidemiology studies, we've, we've heard a lot about a lot of the uh, issues around that. Um, perhaps one of the biggest is we don't even often know what the exposure level is. Not to mention all of the other things that were in the box that I think Lisa or somebody earlier showed with the big question mark. You know, the one area where we do have information comparing animals and human data our, our clinical trials um, for pharmaceuticals. And there we find that um, quite often the animal really does not replicate um, what the human response is. So historically in toxicology, um, due to ethical reasons, you know, we've, we've chosen to do our studies in, in, in animals. And quite honestly, most of that data is in rodent models. And so the question really is, is the, is the rodent, um, and that's what I'm going to argue today, is the, is the rodent really um, a surrogate for, for the human? And what I've, what I've done is I've, I've actually identified two studies that I want to discuss, which um, have been published somewhat recently. And, and the first one I want to talk about uh, was actually a very large study. You can see all the different authors on this paper. But what the point of the study was, was to compare genomic responses between human and the mouse in terms of um, various inflammatory stimuli. And what they did here was they, they compared three inflammatory stimuli, severe blunt trauma, burn injury, and low-dose uh, bacterial endotoxin. Now, as you can imagine, if you do this kind of study, there's a lot of complexity around, around doing these human measurements. Obviously, the demographics, severity of injury, um, the clinical outcomes, and time to recovery. And so these studies were actually quite complex. So for example, for severe blunt trauma, 167 individuals or patients were followed with serial blood draws um, and actually leukocytes were assessed here up to 28 days and then, you know, the transcriptomic signature was, was determined in these studies. So, for example, for severe blunt trauma, uh, there were 4,389 uh, gene changes compared to controls um, that were greater than twofold. In terms of burn injury, 244 individuals were studied up to one year, again, doing serial follow-up uh, measurements. In this case, 2,251 gene changes were observed. And also, kind of the classic um, inflammatory stimulus, bacterial endotoxin was, was actually studied in four individuals, short-term response is 24 hours, and, and again, there were 2,251 uh, gene changes. And so the comparisons that were made in this study were human to human in terms of different stimuli, mouse to mouse in terms of different stimuli, in terms of the genes that were uh, expressed, as well as across the species. And so what did they find? Well, they found that when comparing the correlation of gene expression changes in humans, um, especially if you take a look um, first box here, looking at human 
uh, the, the burn injury compared to trauma in humans, very good correlation in terms of the gene expression changes. In spite of all of the caveats I just mentioned about um, you know, demographic severity of injury and so forth, uh, if we compare endotoxin to, uh, uh, let's see, what do we have here? I can't see from here. Uh, trauma, you can see there's still moderate correlation. Um, same for burn trauma and endotoxemia here. And so there's moderate correlation. But what's really striking is when you start comparing the mouse. So if you compare mouse endotoxemia to mouse trauma, there's no correlation. If we compare mouse uh, endotoxemia, for example, to the gene expression pattern uh, resulting from uh, burn, as, burn injury as a stress um, uh, stimulus, also no, no correlation. And more telling is when you start comparing across species. So let's compare, um, for example, human burn to mouse burn, which is here, virtually no correlation. And, and if you look at this part of the table, these are really the, cor the cross species correlations. So there's, so there's really very, very little, if any, correlation across, across these two species. And in fact, the authors concluded that among genes changed significantly in humans, the murine orthologs are close to random in matching their human counterparts. So let me show you another study. This is actually one in my laboratory where we compared human primary B cells from three species. So we did human, mouse, and rat. And we wanted to make the comparison as close as possible. So not only did we purify B cells, we went the extra step. We took naive B cells from all three species because, as you know, rodents, when we house them at our universities and our laboratories, they're um, pretty much uh, isolated from any kind of pathogens. So virtually most of the, the, the immune cells in, in these animals are naive. So we went the extra step and, and purified these naive cells. And then we activated them in the identical matter, manner, and, and that was in the presence and absence of TCDD. And during a 24-hour time period, we isolated cells at 4, 8, and 24 hours. And then we looked at the gene expression profile. And you can see in human primary B cells, we had differential expression of about 554 genes. In the mouse, we had a whopping 20, 20, over 2,500. In the rat, we were around uh, 700, almost 800. What we were interested in is how did the three species compare in terms of their gene expression profile? And so the answer really is here within the, um, within the, the three circles. We had, we had 28 genes that actually were, were differentially expressed across these three species. And in fact, of those 28, I would argue that probably very few of them even had anything to do with B cell function because they were the AH receptor battery genes like cytochrome P451A1, 1B1, uh, some of the uh, transferases, and so forth. So again, it shows you how little, um, uh, how, how little there is in terms of um, similarity in terms of these gene profiles. So you might ask yourself the question, why is that the case? Well, if we start p looking at um, what has been the ENCODE project. And so for those of you, I'm sure most of you are, are familiar with this, but for those that are not, basically the, the goal of ENCODE was to map functional elements of the human genome. So in large part is looking at the regulatory regions of these genes. And as this was going forward, a second initiative called the MOUSE ENCODE was, was also started. And there was a series of three papers that were published in Nature um, 2014 that um, began looking at comparisons across the two species. And so I just selected this one cartoon which summarizes, I think, some of the really important findings from this paper, or these three papers. So the first thing is um, when you begin to compare across species, and look at orthologous genes, uh, the first thing you see is that the level of transcriptional activity is actually quite different for many of these genes. 
If you begin to look at the regulatory regions, you find, and again, this is kind of illustrated in this cartoon, that some of the transcription factor binding elements or sites are positioned in different places when you look across these species. And in fact, many of the transcription factors that drive these orthologous genes um, are, have binding sites in one species, but not in the other. Also, if we look at the enhancer region, we see the same thing. Different transcription factors are regulating these regulatory regions of the genome. And in fact, to add even further complexity, we have these retrotransponsons, which um, basically are DNA that has been converted to RNA and then reverse transcribed and spliced back into the genome. Well, these also have uh, transcription factor binding sites, which further change or alter the regulatory regions of these genes. So we should not be that surprised that there are differences between, for example, the mouse and the human. These two species diverge somewhere between 70 to 75 million years ago. So um, let me finish with this slide. Um, I think you've probably seen this quote a number of times. Um, it's by George Box that uh, basically he says essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, animal models, especially rodents, I think may be poor surrogates of human biological responses to ex exogenous stimuli. And these two papers I cite are examples of that. And so, you know, what's the path forward? And I guess this is part of the discussion later on, but I'll just throw this out now. You know, employment of human cells and tissues when possible as an, as an adjunct to animal testing, I think is very, very important. Uh, development of human synthetic in vitro models. Um, I think Reza and I will have an opportunity to debate some of the things he, he, he shared in his presentation. So, um, but, but the fact is that we do need better in vitro models, and certainly the in vitro models we have now do not simulate all the aspects of what happens in the, in the intact organism. And then finally, I think some of the new genomic information we're, 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 we're obtaining helps explain a lot of the difference that we're seeing across species and gives us a lot of information about mechanism. So with that, I'll stop and um, turn this back over, I guess, to Gary.